Hello everyone, uh, my name is Sylvia Arthur and I'm the founder of the Library of Africa and the African Diaspora, LOTAD, here in Accra, Ghana. And welcome to our first, first LOTAD Digital Residency Pro Talk. The LOTAD Digital Residency is a five month remote residency that brings together three of the most inquiring young minds in African and diaspora literature, libraries and archives in a virtual think tank to postulate new African futures using indigenous knowledge as a foundation. The residency provides an opportunity for emerging professionals in these fields to benefit from LOTAD's unique resources and community and network with professionals in related areas. Jamie A. Swift is the executive director, creator and founder of Black Women Radicals, a black feminist advocacy organization dedicated to uplifting and centering black women and gender expansive people's radical activism in Africa and in the African diaspora. She is also the creator and founder of the, Black, of the School for Black Feminist Politics, the Black Feminist Political Education Arm of Black Women Radicals. As a political and cultural custodian dedicated to uncovering, restoring, and restituting Black women and gender expansive people's political memories, movements, narratives, and leadership, Swift works with, works with Black feminist activists, organizers, scholars, and educators from around the world to explore and expand on the power, possibilities, and futurity of Black feminisms. Swift has a PhD in political science from Howard University. Tonight, she will be in conversation with our LOTAD digital archivist in residence, Orsod Malik. So without further ado, Orsod, over to you. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, it's really lovely to meet you, Jamie. Um, I have been tracking your work for quite some time now. It's like one of actually the inspirations behind, um, you know, one of my digital archiving projects. So like Black Women Radicals has been a big, big inspiration. Oh my um, God, my cheeks. I feel so crunchy real. right now. I feel so, <laughs> they're turning red over here. Oh my God. It's, it's true, it's true, it's true. And I like, um, yeah, and in, in terms of, I guess, today's conversation, it'd be really, really good to, to pick your brain. But before I do that, um, I just wanted to ask how you're doing. So how, how have you been doing, what you've been working on? I see you're in a new office. Uh, what's been happening? Well, first, I just want to say it's my pleasure and honor to speak with you. Um, sometimes I don't know what Black Women Radicals is doing, on like how people feel on the outside, because I'm like, I'll just do this here and then so it's just it brings great humility um to to just hear that and thank you for all the work you're doing mm -hmm. as well and i'm i'm doing pretty good today i'm started a new position at oxford college of emory university where i'm teaching global black feminist politics and world politics so it's always wonderful to um for many to expose young people to black feminisms from um, a multifaceted and global perspective, which is not always the case. So um, just ha happy to be here. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm, I'm good. I'm also <laughs> good. I mean, I think things have been, yeah, like um, really, really good in terms of the residency. I think it's really helped me kind of, yeah, like formulate, um, I guess I less formulate and more like consolidate a lot of the things that I've been thinking. And, and over the last four months, it's really given me the opportunity to bring kind of uh, different ideas together and then the space to like, yeah, to write and to produce, I guess, like different, an approach to archiving, you know, that I'm that I'm like really interested in developing long-term. So it's been really good to kind of have that opportunity. So my mind's kind of been in it for a while. Um, so I have quite a few, I guess, questions to ask you. I mean, but more so questions about, um, I guess that straddle a bunch of things because I think with this work, I think it comes I don't want to speak for you actually so I'm just I'm just going to ask you the question but like I feel so in terms of archiving how how did you come to it and and yeah how how did you how did you how did you come to this you know this 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 practice well that's such a great question and thank mm -hmm. you I never considered myself to be an archivist mm. I kind of now call myself like a hood archivist a maroon archivist a kilombola mm -hmm. archivist you know because I'm not formally trained in the archives. Mm -hmm. But what I found was I've always been interested in my family's portraiture or like the, the images that we've taken over time. Mm -hmm. um, and always that curiosity ended up, ended up um, wanting me to understand why 
why do institutions steal, extract, and exploit Black people's archives um, or hoard our archives, particularly Black women and gender expansive people's archives? And so um, really with the work with archiving around Black women radicals was simply that I was in a graduate program at Howard University and what's very unique about Howard University, not only is it called considered the mecca of historically Black colleges and universities, but in my department, in the Department of Political Science, there's nowhere in the world where you can major and minor in a grad program in Black politics than at Howard University. So a very niche subfield under the major field of political science. But even with that subfield, Black women and gender expansive people were not there was they weren't incorporated in the syllabi and y'all you already know black women and gender expansive folks have been here we're you know we're always will be here and so my archiving archival pathway was really me trying to restore and resuscitate and like center black mm -hmm. women in black politics um whether that's formally in electoral politics or or something in that nature but mainly informally for me because i study social movements mm. or, uh, radical political organizing in brazil with the emphasis on black queer and trans feminists in salvador bahia brazil mm. and so that's how that pathway got started and i actually got mad because how am i how are you going to talk about black politics you don't talk about fannie lou hamer mm. or uh Polly Murray or Lucy Dig Slow, or even when we talk about politics from a very diasporic perspective, Mabel Dove Donkwa, like how do you not speak about these, these, these leaders in this regard? So long story short, that is how Black Men Radicals was started because I felt like there was a void, mm -hmm. um, not only within the, you know, the ivory tower when we talk about um, Black politics or political science generally, but then the incorporation of uh, Black feminist leaders from um, interdisciplinary, transnational, and multifaceted perspectives. Mm. There's, I mean, there's a lot there, really. I think that I that my brain was just like this, this, you know, because like there is this, you know, firstly the the idea of like family archives, you know, like, and that was very much kind of my introduction was, and then what it helped me do in some ways was um place myself in in history in some ways like so it helped me place my my family and 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 the trajectory of like uh the different members and the different times in which they they these pictures were taken and then it helped me you know I, I, there was a certain age so my family are Sudanese um and a lot of the portraits in my father's house are like you know these these photos with you know um uh, British colonial soldiers you know and they're like that's your grandfather so you know and like and and that you know and these uh, images taken and the backdrop of these images are under you know British colonial authority and then like I didn't grew up around these pictures but then when I finally did my uh, my BA and, and decided in philosophy politics and ethics and started to focus on Sudan specifically those photos the archive the family photos took on a whole different meaning and I you know I was able to really place myself in history so that one I I, I totally kind of relate with you know like um, and then there's this other thing about you and this is something that really stood out to me about black women radicals is that there was this like concerted effort to be like these how do we think about history what does it tell us about history of all of these people are missing from it you know and I guess that's my question to you like what does it tell you you know what is what what does it tell you when when there are all of these I call them gaps but it's much more than that they're like ruptures right like what what what, what you know like what 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 does it tell you um, what has it told you? What, yeah, um. that's such an excellent question. And before, like, I want to tie it into what you were talking about um, your family's, you know, archives and how important that is. I think when you interrogate that more, you recognize we're all walking archives, mm -hmm. um, and and how are we going to um, overcome these revisionist histories that have placed us not only at the margins but to relegate our, our archives is, is not um, imp as important or salient to the greater understanding of history and archives. And that's what I wanted to do with Black and Radicals because the question is, is like, who are we not seeing, right? Um, so you have these really white supremacist, cis heteronormative um, um, 
revisionist histories that have also been absorbed by black people, black uh, black people and people of color as well. And so when you have um, these stories, like for example, I'll give you an example. My department was really shaped by Ralph Bunch, who was the first African-American to receive a political science degree or a PhD in political science. He was also one of the first to uh, receive a Nobel Peace Prize, right? And he's considered to be the father of of black political science, but who is the mother of black political science? You know, her name is Jules Lamar or was Jules Lamar Prestige. And she uh, received her PhD in 1954 at a very young age, I think in her early twenties. So you have Jules Lamar Prestige, you have May King, you have Kathy J. Cohen, who've all expanded the frame of reference of political science. How are you gonna teach about black politics and you don't mention these names, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that's that's my biggest contention. And to bring it into a personal note, myself as born and raised in Houston, Texas, I don't like to consider myself a Black American, but I am a Black American or Black woman living in the United States. I'm an American when I go to Brazil, so uh, a gringa when I go to Brazil. But there's also a problem I have when we talk about who's missing. Often Black feminisms are seen to be uh, Black women and, and, and gender expansive people, Black women, particularly cis women, are seen to be the owners of Black feminist thought and behavior in the United States. That is a form of imperialism and that is a problem. And so my goal is to say who's missing. It's not that they're not missing, we just don't know. Yeah. You know, and so when we talk about Black feminisms, what about Lila Gonzalez or Beatriz Nascimento or Sueli Carneiro or Dishimil Ribeiro? Who are we? Who are we? When Dr. Angela Davis goes to Brazil, she's like, why are y'all fangirling over me? You have Lila Gonzalez, uh, you know? Yeah. So it's kind of not like, it's like, who are we centering? But what does it mean to be at the center? Because these people have already been here. Yeah. Um, and so my job is to make it accessible. Mm. and not hoard information mm. <laughs> like other people do but we're not going to talk about that one right now you know <laughs> <laughs> i hear you because that's 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 the politics of it right like i think that the the this the center this is something i've been trying to explore with this residency it's like what happens you know what are what are the implications uh you know currently when the center is 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 so focused on the West, you know, like, and that's, that's the, you know, like producing history from the West as the center. And, and it, you don't have to be in the West to be doing that because that's been exported outwards, right? So that's like the ways in which these, you know, colonial schools or colonial churches, the, you know, they have moved everyone towards this kind of narrow frame of reference, which is always Europe, which is always the West. And then, mm. so then I'm like, really want to experiment with this idea, right? Like of like, what happens then if you shift the center towards you know some someone like uh, uh excuse my pronunciation because it's not going to be very good but Beatrice Nascimento mm -hmm. and what happens when you think about her work in Brazil in the 80s and then you use that to, to tell world history what if you tell world history from from that perspective you know like and that's that's something that I think has like really driven me to this work in a way like that just like pulls me back because I'm like well you know I've, I grew up in, in, a, in a, you know, like a, in, in, a, in a white neighborhood in, 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 the suburb, in the suburbs of England. So like, and I moved here from Egypt when I was like 10. So like, so I, so things, the center was always very clear to me, you know, like who, you know, what is the center? And then trying to like fit into that center in some way, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I think this, like what you're saying about, um, you know, like these, uh people being missing but not actually missing they're not missing like the, the work is being done the work is like happening all the time it's not just happening in the past but it's happening in the present and it's like so then what happens when you shift that center and I, and I guess that's my next question really like what have you found you know in your work happens when you when you're when you are in Brazil when you are doing your research in Brazil what kinds of like what what has come up for you you know that's such an excellent question um and I love how like you're road mapping like you know Sudan mm. to to London to Egypt to London, um, and also like I don't know I was just thinking about what you were saying. You have so much to bring to the conversation in regards to archives and these revisionist histories from your own personal experiences. And I think that's for me to your question. It's like I had the privilege and opportunity 
One, it's a privilege for various reasons to go to Brazil, because when I go to Brazil from the United States, there's not a lot of Black Brazilians that I see. It's mainly white Brazilians. Mm. It's also a privilege for me to be a light-skinned Black woman uh, with a PhD or was getting a PhD at the time to be able to, you know, have the opportunity to go interview um, um, Black feminists or Black feminist organizers in Salvador. But for me, my first experience going abroad was at 19. I never thought I was able to afford it. I'm the first and only person in my family to even travel abroad. Mm. I'm coming from a very, very working class, working poor background. But when I went there, and first of all, I didn't know that there are Black people in Brazil, which is how you, you know our education educational system is messed up. My first frame of reference of a Brazilian was Giselle Bunchen the German Brazilian uh, uh, Victoria's Secret supermodel at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but when, I, when I've gone there in the past, particularly as I've gotten older, it's expanded. I think it's more about, if we are working towards liberation, how are we going to have several strategies and initiatives in our arsenal and our canon to see where other, in my case, Black feminists have, you know, theorized and organized? How can we incorporate that into our canon in the way that we work and build community with one another? So if I'm teaching Beatrice Nascimento or learning about Beatrice Nascimento and the Quilombo and the concept of the Quilombo, this maroon community, not just being a spiritual place, but a political place of where I stand, right? That means I can take that and come back here and add this to the discussion of, okay, we're talking about quilombos and maroonage. How does this fit to the contemporary conversation about prison abolition, right, in the United States? And that's been my critique. We have these, you know, theories that are, you know, I'm not going to crap on anyone's theories, right, but theories coming out of the U.S. oftentimes that even Black feminists in Brazil incorporate, like, they love Audre Lorde. Audre Lorde is translated into Brazilian Portuguese, Bell Hooks, Alice Walker. But what about Beatrice Nascimento? Is she translated into uh, you know, English, right? Or Lila Gonzalez. If we knew about these theoretical frameworks in this organizing, this could really open up the way that we see our pathways to liberation and how we work with one another. Not that the US is bringing this to you for your liberation. No, Black Brazilians have been always at the vanguard of their own liberation. How do we use this, not use this, but how do we incorporate this into our praxis and work together and work in tandem? That's, that's, that's how I feel like it opened it up for me. Absolutely. And so when I go to Brazil or do my dissertation, oftentimes I post the things I learned about on Black More Radicals mm -hmm. or, or, or do interviews with people I, I, because it's not about hoarding, mm. it's about liberation for me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And yeah, again, there's like so many, so many things that you mentioned that like are ringing so many bells. And I think the first one I'll pick up on is this, like this, the, this transnational element, which I think is like, either it's left out, um, or that it's, um, or that it's geared towards even, you know, progressive movements in, in, in the West, right? So like, so exactly as you're saying, you know, like, so Angela Davis and Alice Walker and all of these people are like translated into Portuguese, they're translated into Arabic, they're translated into like, but what about all of these feminists? What about all of these like liber, you know, people investing so much of themselves and their communities in liberation all over the world? Um, and they aren't being recognized because because of the the way that you know Western institutions hoard knowledge, like you're saying, you know, like it's like the 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 like monopoly over uh, producing and distributing that knowledge is like all hoarded in the West. So then it's like all of these like amazing Western thinkers, Western academics who are for the cause, you know, in our you know, and there's no argument about it. But then mm -hmm. they end up almost you know like so in England, for instance, people tend to think if we're taught if we're asking people in the UK about, you know, freedom fighters in the UK, people, people won't mention Olivia Morris, people won't mention, you know, um, Claudia Jones, people won't mention these people, but what they'll mention are, you know, mainly men and mainly uh, 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 me, um, men in the US. Um, so they'll mention Malcolm, they'll mention Martin, they'll mention these people, but then there is such a difference between this context and, and the US, you know, and like, and what you're saying, I think, 
it's like there is this concerted effort to draw these like transnational links there's like a concerted effort to be like well what happens you know like what mm-hmm. like when we when we can when we think about the brazilian context what does that have to give us you know and you almost have to work against the grain of western institutions to find that right Ooh, like that, or they try to they see what you're doing but they try to steal or co-opt or exploit mm-hmm. your work because mm. it's trendy to be a black feminist or talk about black feminisms. It's, mm. it's, it's now all of a sudden we're going to talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, mm. but you're not really getting at the systems and structures that, you know, that are, that need to be uprooted, you know, mm. but yeah, oh, you know, people don't always like what this means because you're just, like you said, it's a rupture. You're disrupting, um, uh, you know, traditional education, like, and I'm not the first one to do this. There's, I mean, I mean, when you think about, you talk about Olive Morris, I think about Susan Scaife and Dr. Beverly Bryan and Stella Dodsey who wrote uh, um, The Heart of the Race and Black Women's Lives in Britain. And that was, you know, they were doing this type of work before and they're gonna be people doing it after me, right? But it's, it's, it's interesting how you do get pushback from some people, particularly institutions who either wanna work with you and water down your agenda or <laughs> they want to take what you're doing and steal you know steal it um mm-hmm. because i feel like we're at a point in time mm-hmm. where we're going to disrupt what we know as just you know the politics as we we it's always been um there's significant changes and revolutions happening around the world yeah. and resistance and it's time for us to tap into that and create our own Mm-hmm. because these systems to me they're going to crumble so the important thing is how are we building community and mm-hmm. how are we not relying on like for example I'm a, a you know in academia but I know academia will not save me <laughs> this is an exploit you know it's a system of exploitation in academia so what can I get from it and how can I share that with the people I work with and even the people I don't want to work with or people I do work with or people I will work with you know <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I, because I think that there's, you know, like, I wonder if you, you know, I was I've been, I'm working on this, um, this, 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 I guess, like, final piece for the residency, and I'm like, thinking about this, uh, this, um, um, like, how, how to archive solidarity, right, like, how to archive mm-hmm. transnational solidarity, because there are so many pitfalls, right, I found, like, and, and I'm sure you can speak to this, because, like, what I found is that, like, when I'm, trying to make connections between, um, you know, uh, people in the, gl- the global South and, and they're varying different, infinitely varying contexts and different, you know, but like when you're talking about anti-colonialism, there's almost like this universal thing that you'd retreat. You're like, oh, well, everyone's in the same fight so I can put everyone together. But actually there are, d- how do you like, what I'm like really wanna think about is like, how do you build connections and sustain difference and like how's difference, like infinite differences. Like, you know, how, do, and, I, and I wonder if, if you've come across that kind of like that um, question before, you know, like how, if I'm making a connection between people in Brazil and people in, in the US, like how, how do I form that with difference in mind, you know? I think for me, I try not to assume like a fictive kinship because Mm -hmm. I'm black and the other person I'm speaking with is black. But to me, there's not one form of blackness. There's, you know, there's different ways of blackness and being and across gender, across sexuality, across age and across, you know, I think about the process of racialization, how yeah we have similar experiences, but we're not that doesn't mean that we think the same things. And so I made that mistake early on when I went to Brazil, I was like, these are my homies, you know? And they're like, you are American. You are not even preta, you are mulata morena. And, and they were not rude to me, but they were like, okay, girl, you know, pump your brakes. And I, from there, I came in with this understanding, like I have a position of privilege for various reasons in some ways I don't but a lot of ways I do so how can I acknowledge the difference the differences and let for black women radicals specifically let black feminists lead I don't need to for a long time people didn't know but I was running black women radicals and I actually preferred it that way (laughs) but my goal is for example for the school for black feminist politics I literally invite and pay black feminists to teach 
on subject matter to expand the frame of reference of black politics or the power of black feminisms. I don't need, this is what you have to say. I don't want to come in and lord or that's a form of imperialism, right? So mm. my goal is to pay you, bask in your brilliance and support your work. Um, for example, Maria Clara Rujo dos Passos, she's the foremost thought on Afro-trans feminisms in Brazil, led the last teaching for the School for Black Feminist Politics. And working across the difference, many people were like, I didn't even know about Black Brazilian trans women and travestis and their plight and their resistance and organizing across Brazil, but particularly in Sao Paulo and Rio and Salvador. So we recognize difference and not be like, and I'm gonna do a critique of black feminisms, only wanting to uh, gatekeep black feminists who are in academia, uh, light-skinned black feminists, able-bodied black feminists and cis heterosexual black feminists uh -huh. in the United States. I think when we recognize that we need to work across difference, it will not only build solidarity, but it will really transform what we think are black feminisms because it's black feminisms plural not black feminist singular from a u.s perspective so that's i i'm glad to work across difference audrey lord was a key in talking about working across difference um mm -hmm. we need to survive. definitely i mean like it's fundamental i think like what you're saying is just so um so right you know like and so like, because because there is you know like these firstly this like these infinite variations of like blackness too right like and i think for me i, I like um uh, being uh being east african being sudanese and then like arriving in this country um and then instantly like having like which is i guess different from like the u.s experience in a lot of ways um and i don't even mean to homogenize that, but I just did. But I just like, but you know, like, but from my experience, it was like I arrived in the UK as an East African, as a uh, African Muslim, as a Nubian of my ethnicity, as like all of these things from Egypt, and that was very recognizable. And then like arrive in the UK, and then it's just like black, you know. And then it's just like get in there with everyone else, you know. And it's just like there is like the ways in which racialization, the history of racialization, like meets you like right in the face in this country you know like it's like it's like you you arrive and you are lumped in you know into and, and all of your uh cultural specificities all of your complexities all of your difference is totally squashed and then something that I realized in my kind of early days of like archiving uh uh, radical movements and like thinking about radical movements and what they what they could help us understand about the present um is that you know the ways that blackness is like there is a, there are like complications so there are so there are it's not it's not it's not totally sturdy it's not sturdy enough to say well i'm black you're black in all the way in you know brazil for instance um let's get together because actually there's so much that you need to know about me and there's so much i need to know about you you know because our contexts are different but like in order for us to be in the same fight in order like fighting for the same liberation it's almost like we have to like yeah we have to know about each other's differences we have to accept and i find that really difficult at a time where it's i think identity is like fixed sometimes you know like people want it to be fixed um i wonder if you've like come across that you know in your in your you know what this is bringing up in my mind um... so um, as a Black political scientist, there's this group called the National Conference of Black Political Scientists. Mm -hmm. uh, two Black uh, male political scientists, David Coven and Michael Mitchell, were influential in creating this like race and democracy project in Brazil, mm -hmm. where they were taking Black American political scientists to go to Salvador mainly, but other places in Brazil to talk with Afro-Brazilians about their politics. And one of the most leading Fem Black feminist in Brazil, Sueli Conedo, during one of the uh, meetings in Brazil, made a critique and to the point of, you know, as African Americans who have like, who are kind of like the richest, quote unquote, Black people in the United States, why haven't you done more for Afro-Brazilians, right? 
And so I'm reading like these archives from this conference and all the, they're like, oh my gosh, like people were getting so upset. Like, how dare she even say like, and instead of like meditating on what she was saying and being quick to anger. And there was like this response by, I believe his name is James Steele or David Steele that was so like rash and like giving out this statistical analysis on why we, like, we're not the richest. And, 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 and we already know that in some cases, you know, this varies. Obviously, there's class is a amongst the black community is a huge issue here in the United States and around the world. But uh-huh. instead of just meditating on the critique uh-huh. and saying, like, okay, where is she coming from? Why does she have this point of view? How is her experiences informed? Uh, this perspective that she has. I think people were so quick to just be like, assume a fictive kinship and that we're going to be in solidarity without Mm -hmm. having the critique by other Black people, particularly from uh, transnationally. And I think if we could just sit and listen and be like, okay, let's let's meditate on this instead of being so um, ready to fight and have these diaspora wars because I see it on Twitter and I'm like, I don't got time for, you know, <laughs> but it, you know, it's really, you know, it's, I'm like, I can't, I don't even like Twitter like that. Okay. Um, but it's really, it's really true. And I think if we are patient with one another, because we, how are we going to, like I said, get to Ronald Walters, a, a black political scientist wrote like, what does this have to do with the liberation of black people? And he talks about this back and forth we're going to have a back and forth and we're not always going to get along. But what we cannot do is just sit here and act like we're all going to be kumbaya. It's, it's, Mm -hmm. if you read the literature, you know, if you read the scholarship, you know. And so how do we not fall into the same traps moving forward? Um, Yeah. yeah, I love love, Yeah. I mean, that's perfect. Because I love what you say about like this fictive kinship that's come up twice because that's that's such a good way to put it right like there is this assumed this assumed kinship and and the thing is it's I, to me I, I feel like the, the the kinship is is 10 steps ahead but we make that big leap towards that kinship before doing the you know like b- before like acknowledging all the rest of it you know like that's where we want to get to but it's difficult to like I find it it, it, it like brings up a lot of problematics um especially if you're like producing an archive from the west from like from from which which i'm doing you know like how difficult that is if you're already assuming kinship you there are there are experiences there are local complexities that you almost like miss out i'm like i I guess like i'm like lingering on this point so much because i'm like deep in like chandra mahanti right now you know like i'm like thinking about (laughs) her so much you know like and she's yeah really helped me think about um I guess uh, making connections between the West and the Third World, and and the nuances of that, you know. Um, so that's been like really interesting. But um, but yeah, I think I think also what I you know in terms of um, you know archiving from the U.S. right now, and 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 all of the I guess especially I mean over the last like two years being kind of like the real uh, in a lot of ways the thing that sparked global protests happened in the US, you know, two, you know, a year and a half ago. And I wonder like how that has like influenced your work, like how that has like, how that is, you know, the things that have come up because all of a sudden there was this international, you know, kinship and international solidarity, like it, it, everywhere, you know, like there were people in the Congo, like, resi- you know, like excavating their histories and people were excavating their histories all over the place. And they were like, hey, wait a minute, you know, like something's up and we're all connected in these ways. I wonder how like that, that, you know, um, that influenced your work or like what, what you made of it actually is probably a better question. Yeah, last, last year was, uh, was just hard for so many um, Mm. reasons. And I can't believe it's like, it was last year, you know, we're about to be in 2022 and it's like, um, but I think for me, even I will talk about last year, but even before last year, it was so important for me to do like this roadmap of social movements by highlighting black women leaders through the database that black women radicals has and Mm. highlighting historical black leaders. But particularly last year, I was so ignited by these uprisings um, for Black life, particularly with, you know, George Floyd and his um, horrific 
murder that we all had to see on TV over and over again um, as the catalyst to these uprisings. But then I also found it for me in my work to really highlight what was going on in other places because this is all very interconnected. But when we always have this like, like the single access lens of what's going on, it can take away from highlighting radical movement building that's been happening around the world, but was currently happening at that time. So for example, um, I was able to go to Paris and interview um, active black activists in, from Paris for, mm -hmm. uh, or then another from um, a French colleague, Martinique, you mm -hmm. know, highlighting like what was going on in Paris in terms of not just like the racial uh, history of like racial exclusion, but the uprisings that were happening there and also um, in Paris, particularly for, um, I forgive me, I don't speak French, Adama Traore, mm -hmm. um, and uh, his sister Asa Traori, um, and and getting getting justice for his life and how he his life was taken by um, French or Parisian police, right? And so that was one aspect of highlighting what's going on in France. And then there's also uprisings for um, uh, queer and trans communities in Ghana, right? Like what was going on with highlighting that and interviewing activists there. And then with ending SARS in Nigeria, that's like you know thoroughly connected. And then in Brazil, there was um, a similar situation with a woman who um, a police officer put his knee on her neck and that happened around the same time as George Floyd. So it's like, we need to make these critical connections just to say it's not only happening in the United States, right? It's happening around the world. And if any place, I keep going back to Brazil where we should look at how anti-Black state violence is so pervasive, it is in Brazil because mm -hmm. Brazil has one of the highest rates, it's not the highest rates of anti-Black state violence against um, um, Black Brazilians, which they call a genocide, right? But it's also a place where um, trans women, particularly Black trans women, it's the number one place where uh, uh, trans people are murdered in the world. Um, and also high rates of femicide and things of that nature. So if we're trying to see how people are resisting against anti-Black state violence, let's look at these places. Once again, putting it in our arsenal to understand our history better, but where we're going. Um, mm -hmm. So it's just not this one-sided conversation, not to take away from the death of George Floyd, but there was also conversations of, even with George Floyd, what about Breonna Taylor? Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, and, and that happened, her murder happened prior to George Floyd. So how are we, how are we, erasing black women and femmes from the conversation of who um whose life should be uh we should go out in the streets for mm -hmm. um, you know what i mean mm -hmm. um and that happens a lot yeah too. yeah mm -hmm. this is a tough i can't i mean we're still in the thick of it but can you believe can you believe that was last year no i mean the thing is it also feels like it it feels like there was like a significant shift in everything, you know, like in like in 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 not just. It's interesting because like I, the ways in which it was the things that were coming up for me was thinking about like how it it collapsed this idea of like the post racial, you know, like totally just came just totally just breaking down, you know, like and it's things that we've all known for a very, very long time, no matter where we're situated, you know, like it's like something that's like very, very clear that in these contexts, the way that the state manages and surveils and, you know, like, and, you know, the lives of people like in this country, you know, my, like migrant communities, um, black and brown communities, um, gay and trans communities, like there, there are, we, I mean, specifically of color, like it's like, it's, it's we, we know this, but the ways in which when I like, when, you know, like watching Ferguson and seeing like CNN, for instance, like play both sides, but more the side of the, you know, like the side of the police officer, the side of the state, you know, in 2014, I'm watching that really, really care and getting so, so frustrated. And then watching just a total tone change, you know, in 2021, where it was like, actually, you know what, like we don't, we can't because so many people are out on the streets. We can't because there's a new consensus being formed, you know? And it's like, 
And, and that new consensus was so just, it obliterated, you know, this, this like the previous consensus, which is like, no, no, we're past it. Mm-hmm. You know, like it just totally obliterated. So that was, that was the thing that was like coming up for me in a lot of ways was like, was like, oh, okay. Like now uh, my boss at the publishing company that I was working for was like coming down and saying, like, we need to have a discussion about racial equality in publishing. You know, the CEO is coming all the way down to talk to us about organizing, you know, and like, we really care about, and all of these corporations coming up and saying that they care and all of this stuff. So I think, I think that was what was like coming up for me in terms of like, you know, what you're saying about, um, you know, this is happening you know, like all of the, what, 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 and it doesn't stop happening. It just, it's continuous. Like it hasn't stopped since then. It hasn't, it, it was like, it's been a thing for the last 500 years. And it's like trying to think about it, I guess, w- with the curation of my archival work, is that something that I'm like trying to like produce a pedagogy for? And it's like, actually like thinking about things holistically, like thinking about things, not a stop start history where we have the American independence and we have the French revolution. <laughs> But in World War II and then things start, you know, and like, and then we have the civil rights movement. But instead of thinking about like, actually, this is like, if we think about this in like a continuum, like a 500 year project, things start to make connections are easier to make, I feel. Um, what like, yeah, like, so, so I think the collapse of, you know, the post-racial has like meant that these connections, I guess, are more evident, like seeing like people in Colombia, uh, you know, showing us a solidarity with people of Palestine like earlier in the, like last fall and like seeing that happen so like organically and so like strong because it was like U.S. imperialism is still a thing U.S. colonialism is still a thing it's still happening mm-hmm. um and I guess it's finding ways to make those connections with, with archiving um and um and yeah and I wonder for you if if like um how like where do you I know that you're you're like so basically it's a question on the educational element now right like so like the actual pedagogy and and like like how 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 have you found with your students and 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 um and the people around you like when you're how do you make this accessible how do you make this approach you know like how do you make how how have you found what, what works for you you know like when you explain this approach I think there's a level of coming in that you are not better than or overseeing or the master, I hate to use these terms, of of this knowledge, but we're all learning together. And I think specifically for Black and Radicals with the historical history, it started off as a social media page for a very long time in 2018 and for a year and some change I sat there and built the database these interviews I wanted to do uh, of of, and and people I wanted to work with um, and events I wanted to curate because I felt like the people that around me they were doing such great work but because they didn't fit into um, you know, they were very race specific. It was nothing about being post-racial, right? Like, it's not like, that's unfathomable. Like we're not a racial democracy, you know? And so they were not even accepted within the white power structure of academia, nor the black bourgeoisie power structure of academia as well. And, and also outside of academia, because if you're not in academia, you're already uh, marginalized without it for some people. Um, and so I pr- approach it from the perspective of this is academia is not going to have ownership over this organization I'm doing in the sense of, yes, I'm an academic, but that doesn't mean that all the perspectives are coming from academics. Perspectives are coming from young people. Perspectives are coming from elders. Perspectives are coming from, um, I mean, whether you have a four-year degree or not, like, I really don't care. Yeah. That, should, that shouldn't even matter. No. Like what about community? And so with Black Mar radicals, it's it's coming from that approach of really sitting there and highlighting the people that you know. I love El Haj Malik El Shabazz and and uh, you know Malcolm X and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and even Rosa Parks. But what about Nellie Mae Rowe or Irene Amos Morgan or um, you know Paulette Nardal? I mean, like you know, who are these people? And that's how I approach it from that that perspective. And 
I also will say that um, it's a lot of research that I do. Um, mm -hmm. And people are like, oh, well, you know, you could be, you know, one just being transparent. I don't get paid for my work with Black Radical. So it's not my full time job. Right. <laughs> and just right now, I just started, a, you know, building like some sort of team. Most it's been me doing a lot of like all of the work. And people don't understand that, right? But I also work with amazing people. So that's the collaborative aspect, but it's a lot of work and research. Um, and unfortunately with the accessibility factor, you start researching and realizing there's no, there's no biography of some of these women or some of these gender expansive people. They're either the misses of, or um, there's one sentence about them behind a man, like for example, Wilmette Brown. Mm -hmm. uh, Wilmot Brown was critical in creating like Black Women's for Wages, a co-founder of Black Women's uh, Black Women for Wages with Margaret Prescott. Um, and there's no bio, bio of her, you know, like other than her book that I have that's really hard to get. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So it's like, how do we comb through that mm -hmm. so that she can have a bio, you know, mm -hmm. and, and that people can, one thing, and I'll say, I'll quickly wrap up. One of the most humbling things about Black and Radicals is people have said to me, wow, I had given up on my research interest, whether for academia or not, but this event made me feel like I could be a part of something and that could ignite my, my, um, my research into this person or, or, or these people or these social movements or feel like I, I can be a part of a community. And I don't wanna cry because I'm such a sap, right? But that's something that I always wanted to create because I felt like I couldn't be a part of things, you know, or I wasn't smart enough or, or this or that. This is what this is all about. It's, 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 it's about making knowledge accessible and making feel, people feel like I can be a part of something too. And I don't need a PhD to be a part of it, you know. Um, that's it. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> All right. I mean, I mean, like that's that's the thing. <laughs> I mean, but that's that's yeah. Cause I I I think something I'm yeah, I mean everything, everything you said. <laughs> it's like so inspiring, honestly, because that's something I, I found in terms of um when I was talking about like my family archive, uh not even family archive, just family portraits on the wall and then and then uh, when I visit my dad in Egypt and I every few years when I get a chance to do that and and each time I see those images they mean something different and I and 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 it's like I place myself in the world in some in some kind of way and then being able to do that growing up in like um you know like a, you know like the, the, the white suburbs of, 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 of Britain you know like it's like um yeah being able to like finally do that you know like place yourself you place yourself in history place yourself in politics and then everything around you starts to make sense like why people behave in the ways that they do why this suburb is structured in the way that it is like what it, you know all of this stuff and you see that it's by design and I, and I and I I guess like something that I would love to do if and I hope to teach one day you know like and it, it's it's that it's be able to mimic that reflect that in some way like how people place themselves in the world and and understand you know that the, the things that are around that are around them um i don't know that they are agent you know in the things that they're doing that they are that they have that they have so much political agency and 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 it and it's demonstrated in these communities in these histories in these like people that have you know that have like from the ground upwards you know like instead of looking at history from the top down we're actually like you are in the process of making history with every everything that you do you know like and you are part of a much larger um I guess yeah politics of liberation whether you whether you are in it in it or or not you know like I think that that's that's yeah that's uh, yeah so I think everything you're saying is like just pretty inspiring for that reason because it is like so people-centered um yeah and one thing I wanted to say to give you your flowers about your work is I went to, I sit on the advisory board of the Gloria Naylor Archive, mm -hmm. and I went to a summit in Allentown at Lehigh University, and I had the opportunity to listen to, I believe her name is Dr. Michelle Height from mm -hmm. Spelman, and she talks about the politics of reverence in the archives, mm -hmm. and I just am like so grateful to hear about what you're doing with your archives, with your family, because you are giving reverence to them, mm -hmm. whereas, and, and from my personal experience, I don't think from my my ancestors, many of them had the time to dwell on uh, uh, um, 
archiving their histories and 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 you know it's passed down but oftentimes because of struggle and survival it's it's we have to keep moving right and so i i'm so thankful for the politics or, or the reverence that you're you know doing with your family um mm-hmm. because we it's something spiritual about you know particularly with family archives, but also archives of Black people and, Mm -hmm. you know, restoration of our archives. To me, it's a very spiritual practice Um, and often painful, but often often hopeful for the future that when hopefully when I pass on, you know, particularly with Black more radicals, I hope it's not odd or like awkward Mm -hmm. or Mm -hmm. um, something fresh and new to be talking about black women historical leaders it just is Mm. and that the archive can speak to that so i just wanted to say um Mm. yeah thank you thank you i really really appreciate it i like yeah that means a lot and i i I have like so many more questions but i i I feel i feel like i feel like probably won't last four minutes but there was so many so much more i wanted to ask you but thank you so much for your time and just like making yourself available and and to 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 have this discussion i know how busy you must be and like um so so yeah i i I really how busy you must be so i just thank you for the amazing conversation and thank you to sylvia for inviting me so yeah thank you so much it was so great i feel like i could keep talking to you for a long time (laughs) yes yes, me too me too i very strongly yeah for sure um yeah well um thank you so much um to you jamie obviously um as also has said um I thought it was a really moving conversation, actually. And I think between you almost crying, me almost crying, and also being reverent, <laughs> it, it could have turned into something, uh, yeah, that we were not expecting. But um, thank you so much. And um, yeah, I mean, this was, this was amazing. This was our first uh, LOTAD Digital Pro Talk. Um, it's meant a lot to me. I'm sure it's meant a lot to Orsad, as he said. And we're just very grateful. grateful. Thank you. Thank you both Orsad and Sylvia. Just, yeah, I'm, I'm overjoyed. Thank you so much. <laughs> too, me too. Okay, thank you. Oh, uh, Ada, did, did, I think Ada, did you want to say something? Oh, no, um, I was inspired by the talk. Thank you so oh, much. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Uh, stay, uh, stay, stay in touch. I mean, I, 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 perhaps I can share my email and, and, and if, if, if there's like, yeah, just. Yeah, I'm about to drop my contact here um i put it in the email that's my personal one the gmail i mean yeah okay my name and then yeah this is the black man radicals one but feel free i would love to connect further and thank y'all so much for everything definitely thank you so much jamie thank you Bye. thank you sylvia thank you also will you stay thank on you. oh yeah, yeah of course uh, yeah yes okay. yeah. thanks bye bye bye, bye. bye. Okay, let me stop recording.